Hello everyone, welcome to our third lecture entitled Local and Global Communication in Multicultural Settings. So again, this is Professor Rin Makarvahal, but you can call me Miss Cars. And um, I decided to turn my camera off because of my allergies, you know that. Okay, anyway, so um, before we delve deeper into communication in multicultural settings and the issues that are surrounding this particular topic, uh, it's imperative that we know first what culture means, okay? So let's try to see what culture is, okay? So according to Stringer and Cassidy, 2009, culture is a system of thinking and acting that is taught by and reinforced by a group of people. Cultural groups teach their members certain sets of values with accommodating behaviors and communication preferences. So as you can see here, culture is a system. So therefore, there is a set of rules, behaviors, embedded uh, principles and whatnot that we instill in our people. And take note that this is taught by and reinforced by a group of people. So meaning culture is adapted or adopted, okay, whichever might apply. And this is something that is socially all right, um, inherited. Okay, this is something that is gotten from outside factors or outside forces. This is actually why you know dictionary meanings would tell you that culture includes the tastes and manners that are favored by a social group or that um, culture is all the knowledge and values shared by a society or culture uh, is the attitude and behavior that are characteristic of a particular social group or organization. And this leads us to the point that we have to have what we call cultural understanding, okay? Because cultural understanding is something that influences our personal preference and communication style and continues to influence our perception of others throughout our life, okay? You have to understand where you're coming from as a group, as an organization, or as a society, as a community. You have to understand and accept your background, Okay, where you grew up in, uh, who you grew up with, and what are the characteristic values and manners that are in it. Okay, because having cultural understanding is knowing you. And apart from knowing you, it's knowing others as well. Because when you know you, you can re better relate to others. Okay, so um, you have to start from understanding what's within you and what are actually influencing the person that is you before you can well relate to other people. Now at this point when you already have cultural understanding, you may now see that apart from your culture, there are diverse cultures outside it that you really need to comprehend and you really need to have a grasp about. This is because you have to tolerate diversity. You have to embrace diversity and differences that is outside your own culture because you have to inevitably communicate cross-culturally, okay? Which leads me to the point that every time that you are talking to people outside your own culture, you're doing cross-cultural communication. Okay? And cross-cultural communication occurs between people who may have different culture perspectives. Okay? This include the entire range of differences from nationality to age to different departments within the same organization. So let me give you an example. Differences in nationality. You're a Filipino. When you talk to a foreigner, automatically you're doing cross-cultural communication. Okay? As a Filipino, you've got your own set of beliefs of traditions of manners of characteristics and you try to mingle with a foreigner who has their own so doing that you may enc encounter several barriers and several struggles but still you are able to do it because you have understanding of your own culture and their culture and that there are several differences between the two of you 
So cross-cultural communication does not only happen between nationalities, it can also happen between age groups. So for example, you're a Gen Z person or you're a person who is born in the computer age and then you talk to an older generation who does not know about computers and what they do or who does not understand how internet works or cannot really even use a phone. So that is already cross-cultural communication because there's a lot of... Uh, barriers that you have to cross and that y- you have to really uh, understand the other end because you're really coming from different perspectives and technicalities for that matter, right? So there are a lot of issues that surround cross-cultural communication and three of which would be generalizations, stereotypes, and perception. Okay, so let's go uh, for generalization first. It says here that generalizations are the patterns of communication used by most people in any cultural group. So we can actually generalize based on the, you know, characteristic uh, characteristics of the population of the culture group. So for example, we can generalize Filipinos as hospitable people. Now, if you're going to apply this generalization to each and every one that belongs to that culture group rigidly, then that becomes stereotype already. Okay? You are now trying to box, okay, each and every individual in that certain group as what is and what is not. Okay? So for example, the generalization is uh, Filipinos are hospitable. Winma is a Filipino, therefore Winma is hospitable. Now, what if Winma is not really hospitable? What if she doesn't really like welcoming guests? What if she really doesn't like mingling with other people? Okay, so that is not true to her. But you trying to box Winma into being hospitable simply because of that certain generalization among Filipinos, it is what we call stereotyping. Okay, so stereotypes are cultural norms, okay, applied to everyone in the group in a rigid manner. So this is to say you are generalizing hastily, okay, that's hasty generalization, or you are sweeping, you're doing sweeping statements, okay, so when we say sweeping statements, you're trying to sweep it all into that one certain fact, when in fact, um, not everyone could actually fit into that generalization. Okay, so stereotypes are negative in connotation because these are cultural norms that are really going overboard. So another example uh, for stereotypes, let's say women, okay? Generally speaking, this is uh, an accepted generalization, okay? Women are weaker than men in terms of uh, physical aspect, right? Because science has evidence for it, physiologically, um, we can actually prove that. That's an acceptable generalization. Generalization, But for you to say, for example, that women can't pull themselves into the army is stereotyping that women can't do anything simply because they're weaker than men and they're only inferior to men when in fact there are certain women that could actually pull their weight together in the army. So even when women are generally weaker in terms of physical aspect, doesn't mean that each and every woman, woman cannot really do that thing. Perception is highly personal and cultural at the same time. So you perceive people and things and places and whatnot um, based on what you experienced and what you are experiencing personally and culturally. Okay, So again, culture plays a very big role in terms of shaping our perspectives, Okay, how we see the world, how we see people. And because of these issues, we are experiencing a lot of cross-cultural miscommunication okay and according to Barna 1997 there are six primary sources of cross-cultural communication miscommunication okay first of which is assumption of similarities now what is this so the invisible aspects of our culture lead us to assume okay that our communication style and way of behaving is how everyone communicates and behaves so meaning when they act like us we think they are right or we don't give it much thought, right? But when someone acts differently, we may judge them. Okay? As again, we judge them negatively because we assume that everybody should be similar and similar with us. Right? Next, language differences. So language differences, language barriers, right? So speaking a non-native language, for example, can easily lead 
us to miscommunicate. So Filipinos in general would have a hard time pronouncing cup, cup, and cap. Okay, sometimes um, we just pronounce this as cap. So when you talk to a foreigner um, and say cap, we might not know like what really you're trying to pertain to. Right? Because we're not really used to saying a eh, eh, bag, cat. You say cat, bag. People speaking the same language actually can experience miscommunication because the same word can mean something different. So, for example, um, in the west coast of the United States, pop would usually mean the soda drink, right? While on the east coast, it often refers to drug use or shooting someone. So, you say pop her, pop him, it means sh uh, shoot her, shoot him. So another example would be in the United States, um, being stuffed would mean you have too much, you had too much to eat. While in Australia, it often means you are pregnant. Okay, so these differences can impact our communication negatively. So hence miscommunication. Okay. Thirdly, nonverbal misinterpretation. So nonverbal misinterpretations: we send and receive wordless messages through body language, facial facial expression, and eye contact, and even clothing and furniture style can actually communicate unintended or an unintended message. Okay, so it really matters a lot. Just a smirk or a smile or a raise of eyebrow can actually makes a lot of difference in terms of communication, and a lot of times this causes miscommunication. Okay, fourth. Uh, we have preconceptions and stereotypes. So, preconceptions and stereotypes, actually, uh, this has something to do with our conceptions. So, culture influences the way we see the world, right? Sometimes we've got preconceived notions already about someone or something, and, and you know, stereotyping occurs already when s oversimplified characteristics are used for us to judge people or a group of people. Okay, or an individual associated with a certain group. So yeah, stereotyping and preconceptions. Again, very, very uh, big issue. Next, tendency to evaluate. This is somehow, somehow related to it because when we hear communication or observe behavior, we tend to interpret the message or the action through our cultural lens, just our cultural lens. So we may evaluate the message or behavior as good or bad without really understanding the intent okay so it's just the basis is just our cultural lens okay lastly is high anxiety again high anxiety is caused uh, by this high affective filter okay we are so anxious about what we are gonna say next about uh, how uncomfortable we are in our thoughts and whatnot. So not understanding what is appropriate or expected can raise our anxiety level. And this communication can be a direct result of being in an anxious state. So for us to battle this, uh, we have to prepare, we have to rehearse, we have to socially, mentally um, be, you know, ready to actually do communication. Okay? So, uh, at this point, I would like to move on to varieties and register. Okay, so varieties and registers are very important concepts in terms of multicultural um, communication because these are the factors that directly and indirectly affect our communication and may make or break communication. Okay. So let's go to uh, register first. Okay, register is the level of formality in the language as determined by context. So again, I've been talking about context since day one, and you probably understand what context mean by now, okay? And depending on the context, or um, defined by the purpose and the setting, we need to decide what which level of formality we have to use. So that's what we call register. So we have formal register, we have non-formal register, right? So formal register, is again uh, when you do these things so for example when writing business letters letters of complaint some essays reports official speeches announcements professional emails we have to use formal register right um, because these are formal occasions or formal situations therefore um, we don't use contractions we don't use slang okay we don't use we rarely use the the first person or the second person point of view we try to sound formal therefore we use the third person okay 
uh, we avoid too much passive in formal register we also avoid slang idioms we have to avoid exaggeration or cliches we have to go straight to the point we have to go to the business itself okay we don't beat around the bush we do it formally try to avoid using abbreviations and acronyms um, if you're doing formal register uh, you have to uh, write what abbreviations and acronyms mean and then you have to write incomplete sentences so never write in incomplete sentences when you're doing formal register right and also do not start your sentences with like so but also okay this is very informal in nature so again please make sure that you have a subject and a predicate in your sentences so it um, it would really be formally structured okay now we've got um, non-formal register um, non-formal registers uh, we, we use it for personal emails phone text short notes friendly letters most blogs and diaries and journals so these are full of slang and cliches and figurative language which is which are very much welcome because again this is very non-formal so meaning uh, you, you may just be talking to a friend or someone really close to you it doesn't really matter like how you sound to them because you're not really doing a formal transaction Okay, um, this is also full of symbols, abbreviation. For example, your short notes are full of abbreviations, acronyms, whatnot. Okay, and you can even use the first person and second person, right? Point of view there freely. And you can use a short sentences, incomplete sentences, you can have no paragraphs, you can even crack jokes, and you can have personal opinions put forward there. Okay, and the most common thing in non-formal register is the is the extra punctuation or the excessive use of punctuation. Like for example, you say "Hi Bob!" exclamation 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 point. Okay, like uh, at ten exclamation points. But the, but it's very welcome, right? Sometimes um, in non-formal register, you write as if you speak. Okay, that's why you you tend to do these extra punctuation and whatnot. Okay, and uh, again, um, there are gray areas. It's not only uh, formal and non-formal. We have gray areas like, for example, here, we've got level formality. So we have the continuum of formal and non-formal. Between them, we've got neutral, intimate, frozen, consultative. So what are these? So for example, neutral register um, is usually used for broadcasting, for news, uh, writing, uh, basically to put forward an opinion and from the public. Okay, so you don't need um, to have a, to be very opinionated. All you do is lay down the facts. That's why it's just neutral register. Okay, intimate register, you do that for uh, when you're talking to someone really close to you. Uh, perhaps a family member or a best friend or someone who you're not really related with but um, someone who you trust okay and who you are comfortable with okay perhaps a partner okay or a soulmate frozen register uh, meanwhile is something that we see in the bible or in history books for example um, because this these are the the registers that are meant to be preserved that are meant to be unchanged so for example in the bible you say thou shall not steal okay and until now we can actually uh see it or read it because this register is preserved okay it's not changed nor is meant to be changed consultative register so we've got um for example you talking to me a student talking to a professor regarding his or her grade or his or her output or class standing etc etc okay so again it's not only formal non-formal there are gray areas like those that i said lastly i would like to talk about variety so variety is a specific set of linguistic items which can be associated with external factors such as the geographical area or social group so when we say linguistic items these are sounds words or grammatical features okay so these are the different variety is a set of sounds words grammatical features that are unique to a particular geographical area or social group now variety develops for a number of reasons uh, number one geographical area um, differences can come about for geographical reasons like people who live in different geographic areas often develop distinct dialects or variations of language so for example um, 
even when people are uh, native speakers of English, based on their geographical location, they can develop this certain variety of English. Like um, standard American English is very different from British English. This means that whether you say often or often, it doesn't matter because there's no one correct pronunciation. Again, these are called varieties of language. So varieties of English, you may just choose whatever you're comfortable and the only thing that matters is that you be consistent about it. You know, you, you don't have to argue whether it's mo mobile or mobile because again varieties of English is the key to it okay we have to understand it from that perspective okay now um, for social group for example um, certain people who belong to a specific group often academic or professional tend to adopt jargons that is known to and understood only by the members of the specific group so for example, um, gay lingo is a variety of language that only people who belong to that social group understand. Okay, Or for example, there's a certain way of English speaking uh, when you go to Ateneo and then when you go to La Salle. Okay? So language varieties are often basis of judgment and again, even inclusion or exclusion. Okay, so I hope you guys learned something uh, from this lecture. So, I will end here. Please stay safe and sane, everyone. Goodbye.